calm our hearts. God, we ask Jesus that you would be here this morning. We praise your holy name, God. Change our hearts, change our minds, change our lives. We worship you. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. Yeah, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. We praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Yes, Lord. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of Him. our faith. God, make us believe even more. Now we'll believe for greater things. There's no power, the power of Jesus. Let faith arise and let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Well, I will believe for greater things. There's no power like Power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on, declare that. Well, I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that faithfulness how he's been there from the beginning to the end even when we didn't see it then he is faithful
faithful through the ages, God. You're faithful to us. God, whether it was yesterday or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, God, you've been faithful through it all, God. And in the midst of trials, God, we may not see your faithfulness or your goodness or um, your hope, God, but you've been there every step of the way, guiding us, God, 
to who you've called us to be. God, I pray for each and every one of us that we are reliant on you, Jesus, that we are clinging to the goodness of God this morning. God, you are so good, and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Whoo, man, I told y'all. Y'all glad to be here? Man, that's good, isn't it? Good stuff. And it's just about to get better. It's about to get better. Chris is about to come up here and share in just a few minutes. It's going to be amazing. If you wouldn't mind, do me a favor. Um, if Take your phone out, and you can scan the QR code on the back of the chair, or if you're sitting on the front, it's on the front of the, ch- on the sitting on the chair. Scan that for me, because there's multiple things you can do with that as the service goes on. One of those things is there is a link there where you can click on um, for uh, the sermon notes, and I would encourage you to do that and to follow along as Chris shares here in just a few minutes. Um, there's also one thing that you can do on there. It's, um, if you're interested in giving, I just want to say thank you for your generosity as a church. One of the things that um, we have been blessed with just over the last week or two, we've had opportunities to step in the gap and help people um, with, with water and help people with plumbing issues and things like that. And because of your generosity, we're able to do that. So we want to say thank you. And if you are interested in giving, you can do it through the link tree that as you scan that QR code. You can also do the Church Center app. Or you can, if you're here at Paradise Campus, you can drop it off in the generosity boxes as you leave today. Man, I'm telling you, today is going to be an amazing day. It's going to continue to be amazing. We're going to continue the series that talks about We Are, the vision of Grace Fellowship, as our lead pastor comes in just a few minutes to share about We Are for that next generation. I'm so glad you're here today as we're continuing our series called We Are, those here in paradise, those joining us online. Man, this is a great day to be here. If you're just checking out Grace, checking out the God thing, I feel like this series kind of gives you just a taste of what we believe, but here's what I would encourage you to do. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're still uh, kind of new to Grace, here's what I would say, or maybe you just have never really dug in deeper to figure out what, what we believe and, and who we are. Uh, we have a grow class called Foundations, where we look at the foundations of what we believe as, as a church, who we are as a church, but here's the other thing that I love about this class. If you've ever come to a place where you've gone, all right, how do I grow? grow in my faith. I want to be able to grow. Maybe it's time for me to grow in my faith. I feel like we give you tools in that class. There's tools available in that class that help you figure out how to grow in your faith. I would love for you to be a part of it. I'd love for you to to, to sign up for that. The easiest way is to scan the QR code. When you scan the QR code, it'll look something like this. You just scan it. it, It'll bring you to a link, uh, 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 what's called a link tree. It has all these links where you can also find sermon notes and all those kind of things. But then just click on the grow class. You can get more information. It is next weekend, and if we have 100 people sign up, Rocky will shave his head. I'm just kidding. I made that up. Uh, But we love, we love for you to be a part of that uh, next weekend. Um, When you walked in today, uh, you were given Play-Doh that looks like this. Uh, Go ahead and take it out. Go ahead and take it out of its container. Um, How many of y'all play with Play-Doh as kids? Yeah, yeah, most of, you, most of us. I didn't really like playing with Play-Doh because it didn't taste good. Um, you know, <laughs> I like to eat everything as a kid. So, uh, you know, uh, when you pulled it out of the container, how many of your, you pulled, out, pulled the, the Play-Doh out and it looked like a truck already? How many, it already looked like, a, it looked incredible. No one? What, what about you pulled it out and you're like, man, that is the most amazing Play-Doh dog I've ever seen. Right? How I many pulled it out and it was just, it was, it was already created in something. You're like, oh my goodness, that is amazing. Right? Obviously no one. Because it hadn't been formed yet. Uh, it, it was still in its most uh, moldable form. But if you give it enough time, some of you who are 
really talented could make it into something that looked really awesome. You know, a truck, a dog. If you're more like me, I'm very good at pancakes, all right? You can make it into your own pancake. But if you were to leave it out too long, what happens? It dries out and gets crusty and less moldable, right? I feel like this is a picture of why we are for the next generation at this church. Because we want to invest in people before they get old and crusty. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. We want to. It's not the way I was supposed to say that. Uh, We want to invest in people. While they're most moldable, while they, while they can still uh, be formed, while God is still forming who they are, who, they, who, who God wants them to be. You can go ahead and put the Play-Doh up uh, so it doesn't dry out. And honestly, so you don't get it on the carpet and Rocky gets mad about that. Uh, but we want to invest in the next generation. We are for the next generation because we want to invest when, they are, when people are most moldable and most impressionable. Starting at about the age five, kids are already beginning to build their own idea of their own self-esteem. It's in their formative years that they begin to determine what their identity is and what they believe about themselves and what they believe about the world and what they believe about God. We're for the next generation because that's when they're most formable and and impressionable. And so we want to put them in a place where, where God can form them and God can inform them of who he made them to be. But it's also the time when ministry is the most fruitful. uh, Our our church exists to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a study done by the Barna Group, which is a a research group, who who polled Christians, who who, uh, adult Christians, uh, adults who claim to be followers of Jesus, and, and, and asked them, at what age did you put your trust in Jesus? At what age did you become a Christian? And the research found that 94% of adult Christians came to know Jesus before the age of 18. Only 6% came to, know the, came to know Jesus, became followers of Jesus after the age of 18. If you had the opportunity to invest in a company or in two companies and one promises about a 94% return, the other a 6% return, which one are you going to invest in? We want to invest in the next generation when they're most moldable and when ministry is most fruitful. But also we, we want to invest in the next generation. We're for the next generation because we believe that's where the most potential impact is. That's where, where we have the most potential impact to impact the future uh, that, that we're going into. We see throughout history how this has been true uh, and, and how this, this idea that they're, they have the most potential to impact the future ha- has been used for good and for evil. In the 1930s, Hitler started Hitler Youth. And it was an organization much like Boy Scouts, and he later uh, banned Boy Scouts from Germany. So any kid who wanted to be a part of something like that had to be a part of Hitler Youth. And by 1939, over 90% of the youth in Germany were part of Hitler Youth. During that time, he overtook the education system and and banned and removed any ideology that, that, that was resistant to the Third Reich. And historians say it was through these moves that he was able to raise a generation of soldiers who were willing to abandon their family and reject their family for the sake of his cause. See, Hitler understood the potential of the next generation and the problem is he exploited it for evil. But God has used it for good many times throughout history as well. At every great awakening and spiritual revival and spiritual movement, at the epicenter of almost every single movement of God, major movement of God, there is a contingency of students that are leading the way. If you look at key figures that God used throughout Scripture, often we see that their stories in Scripture begin while they're still youth. There's a man named Samuel who was a man of God that God would speak to Samuel and he would speak to the nation of Israel and give God's word to his people. When we first hear about Samuel, Samuel is less than 10 years old and and, and before he was 10 years old, he heard the audible voice of God. Then there's a young man named Joseph, many people, not not Mary and Joseph, but Joseph uh, as in the coat of many colors, Joseph in the Old Testament scripture. And uh, he he, uh, was sold into slavery by his brothers. But then God raised him into leadership in the Egyptian empire. 
to a place where he later rescued his family by allowing them to move to Egypt to escape famine and drought where they would have died. And that family became the nation of Israel. Well, Joseph's story starts when he's just a youth and God gives him a dream of what's going to happen one day. Then you've got uh, David. We talk about uh, in, in the culture, you hear the story of David and Goliath, the battle of David and Goliath, often talking about the big company versus the small company or the big school against the small school. But that story goes back to a young man named David who wasn't even 20 years old because he wasn't old enough to fight with the Israeli army. And he went out to just take his brother's supplies and he got there and found out the Israelites were faced up against the Philistines and they had agreed to to let the the best warrior for the Israelites to step out and face the best warrior of the Philistines but no Israelites would step up to the challenge because Goliath was a giant and a fierce warrior. But yet this young boy in his youth steps up to the challenge because he believes that God will do what God says he'll do. And he defeated the giant with just a sling and some stones. And then if you look at the key figures that that Jesus called to follow him, to be his closest disciples, uh, uh, all of them, uh, arguably none of them were, were able to grow facial hair when Jesus called them to follow him. They're all teenagers. See, throughout history, we can look back and see how the next generation, the, the, young, the upcoming generation has made an impact on the future. History shows the power and the potential of the next generation, but so often we miss our opportunity to see what God can do in the next generation, and we miss it for several, several reasons. Sometimes we just simply get stuck in the kids these days mentality, right? Well, kids these days are so disrespectful and they're so, you know, entitled and late. Like we get stuck in that. Did you know generational shaming, that's what I'll call it, has been going on for thousands of years? It dated all the way back to ancient Greek literature where one generation turns and criticizes the next. There's a quote I read this last week, which I think is so telling. It says this. What monsters we've become. We bring a new generation into this world only to convince them of their shortcomings so they can wield the same charges against their peers. We send children off into the future telling them the greatest moments have already passed. We get hung up and focused on the ways that they're different and what they're not that we miss what God could do. And we often miss our opportunity to impact the next generation because we get caught in this kids these days mentality. Sometimes we miss our opportunity because ministering to the next generation is difficult. What once worked doesn't work anymore. We can't, you can't say, well, when we were kids, we did. It doesn't matter. Life has changed. Times have changed. What once worked doesn't work anymore. And so it's difficult. It's always changing. And not only that, it can be incredibly expensive at times. But if you think about it, the industry spends billions of dollars marketing to this next generation. So often when we're trying to minister to them, it can become expensive in order to, to engage them in relevant ways. To the extent where I've had people in churches at times tell me, why are we spend so much money on, on a, gener- or a group of kids that doesn't give back to, to the church? And I feel like that mindset is so short-sighted. Because it's not about money, it's about impact. Ministering to the next generation is difficult and, and it's inconvenient and it doesn't promise a quick return. It, it, I used to tell our adult leaders, hey, listen, don't give up on, on, on serving. Don't give up on the next generation because you don't see something. It takes students an average of 18 months, average 18 months to begin to trust an adult mentor. And often we give up far too early. Hold on, wait. It's inconvenient. It's difficult. It is a ministry that requires being in it for the long haul. And sometimes we miss our opportunity just because of wrong mindsets. We get this mindset of, well, it's their parents' job. Parents got to parent better. It's the pastor's job. I mean, we hire people to do that. It's the professional's job. The problem is that if we miss our opportunity to mold the next generation, we will miss our greatest opportunity to impact the future. 
We'll miss our greatest opportunity to impact the future. Not only that, if we fail to pass on our faith to the next generation, we fail to, to, to give them and pass on the only thing that will bring them peace and purpose and stability in the future. If you think about it, we're eager to pass on so much to the next generation. We're going to pass on our values. We're going to pass on manners. And we're going to pass on our work ethic. We're going to pass on our, our, our athletic build, ability. We pass, we, we're eager to pass on so many of the things that we value. And yet we become so passive often when it comes to our faith, hoping that maybe just by chance they'll discover it. In the book of Judges, we see uh, what happens when one generation fails to pass on their faith to the next generation. I believe there's an error we need to recognize and, and, and avoid. At this point in, in the nation of Israel, Joshua is now the leader and, and they've taken the land that God had promised them. They'd watched as God had fought for them and on their behalf and done miraculous things over and over again and they served God. But then they failed to pass on their faith to the next generation. I want you to see what it says in Gen Judges 2 verse 10. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for, is for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people all around them. They basically just said, hey, let's just do what everyone else is doing. Let's just, look, we're in this land now. Let's, let's just live like everyone else. And they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel. So he handed them over to the raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. He said, if you, if you turn your back on me, things are not going to go well for you. I'm, the, I'm your deliverer. I'm your rescuer. I'm the one who fights on your behalf. But if you abandon me, you're going to abandon the only thing that will save you. And the people were in great distress. See, there's a principle that I believe that we should learn from this and a principle that we need to take to heart and it's this. When we fail to pass on our faith to the next generation, we fail to position them to experience God's best. It says they angered the Lord and the Lord began to fight against them. That the Lord caused their efforts to be unsuccessful. See, we're eager to pass on so much to the next generation. And we do so much, but, but yet we, we often fail to pass on the, the very thing that, that would help them experience God's best. And we want the best for our kids. I want the best for my kids. A lot of times we go, man, I just want them to have better than I did. And if we want them to experience the best, we've got to position them to experience God's best. And that grace is, this is what we mean when we say we're for the next generation. Because we want to position the next generation to experience God's best by passing on our faith. Because we believe this. The next generation holds the greatest potential to form the future. If you want to see God move in this world, you want to see God change some things and change the, what, what's going on in our culture, uh, the, the greatest potential to form the future is in the next generation. And we believe that here at Grace. And because of that, there's, there's five things that we want to be very intentional to do. First of all, we want to do everything we can to help them experience God in a real way now. We want them to have a personal experience with God. Not, not have borrowed faith, not have mom and dad's faith, but we want to teach them and help them see who God is so they can experience him for themselves. There's a godly man named Asaph who wrote much uh, uh, of uh, scripture in Psalms. And, and in Psalm 78, he put it this way. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. 
We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel, to the nation of Israel. And he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. Even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. At Grace, we want to teach the next generation of how great our God is, how good he is, who he is, so that they can experience the truth of who he is for themselves. So while they're forming their identity and, and their worldview, God is the one who gets to form their identity. God is the one who gets to form their worldview. At, at Grace, we, we work really hard to create engaging experiences in our kids' ministry and our student ministry. I'm just going to tell you this. Look, I, I'm going to do everything I can as a parent to keep my kids engaged in those environments because I know that we're doing everything we can to present truth in relevant ways, age-appropriate ways, where they can discover who God says they are and God's plan for their life. And students, listen to me. If you're in here, I want you to be a part of the student ministry. I want you to help us form the culture where you and your friends begin to figure out how God wants to use you to change the world. I don't believe there's any better place to be than, than be intentionally putting yourself in a place where God can form the way you see yourself and the way you see the world. We want to help the next generation experience God for themselves, and then we want to equip them we want to equip them by teaching the, the truths about God, about teaching the truth about who he is, about he wants us, what he wants us to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's a guy named Moses who helped deliver. Uh, God used to deliver the, the Israelites from the captivity in, in Egypt. And then once they've, they've been delivered, he says, all right, tell, tell Israel this. This is what they need to know. And this is what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. You to commit everything you are. You, you're all in. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. It says, tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He says, man, put it everywhere you can see it. Here, here's what he's, he's, yeah, it's good to put it everywhere, but here, here's the heart behind what he's saying. He says, create, all, create opportunities for them to experience God's truth in everyday life. That it doesn't become just something you do on the weekend every now and then. That it becomes a part of the identity of who you are. Not just as a, as a person, but as a family. And, and I want you to see, he says, hear, O Israel. He doesn't say, hear, O parents. He says, hear, O Israel, all people who are followers of God. Be sure that you, you invest in the next generation in such a way that they will experience who I am. See, we don't want to just teach them for information. We want to teach them for transformation, to help them see how to apply God's word to their lives. In, in, in Titus uh, chapter 2 in scripture, a guy named Titus is talking to the leaders of the church, and he says, hey, the, the older men need to mentor the younger men, and the older women should mentor the younger women. What he's saying is, hey, don't just tell them what to do. Begin to live it out in your life and, and, and show them how to follow Jesus. You don't have to have it all figured out. Do it together. You're on a journey together. You see, he wants us to show them how to follow Jesus because we know the truth that what is seen is often or mostly more impactful than what is simply said. That we would demonstrate what it looks like to follow Jesus with the ups and downs. And then we need to raise our expectations. At, at, at Grace, I want to raise our expectations of the next generation. Well, for whatever reason, we've come to a place where we expect the next generation to fail. I hate that. As a student pastor, I used to hate it when, when parents would go, oh, they're just being teenagers. Oh, they're just going out and sowing their wild oats. Oh, just doing what college students do. I was sitting there going, why do we expect them to do things that, that go against who God says they are, that will hurt their, 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 themselves and, their, and, and who God has, has designed them to be? We, we should raise our expectations for the next generation. A guy named Paul, we talk about him a lot. God changed his life. He went from persecuting Christians to God using him to plant churches. And he took a young man named Timothy who was merely a teenager, 
under his wing and begin to, to mentor him. He wasn't related. He was just someone that he looked at and he, he believed in and brought him under his wing. He said, man, you've got to raise your expectation. He raised his expectation for Timothy. This is what he said. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. See, that's Paul saying that to, to Timothy. And I think often that's used with, with teenagers and students. Hey, this is a great verse for you. I want to turn that around to the church and say, hey, let's stop looking down on the next generation and expecting them to fail in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Let's believe, begin to believe that who God made them to be is enough and that God can use them to lead the way in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. We will never raise leaders by lowering the bar. Let's raise our expectations and believe that God can do what God wants to do in their lives. That he can use them to lead the way. We want to raise our expectations and we want to empower them. We want to empower them to be a part of what God wants them to do now. A couple summers ago, I went on a uh, vacation with the family um, and uh, my youngest son we, we were doing little water slides my youngest son wanted to do this one water slide we got up to the top Ari climbed all the, the steps had the little float you're supposed to go down he's like oh lifeguard's like oh he's too, he's too short he can't go down and I was like come on man like I'm his dad I, I'm, I'm willing to take the chance I figure uh, it's okay right I'll roll the dice you will um, he can swim uh, and so uh, we, we talked back and forth. He's like, well, I'm going to get in trouble for it. I'll let him do it this one time just so he doesn't have to walk down. I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's all right. Well, I'll take the heat. I don't know why I said that. But I was like, I'll take the heat. So we go down and we get to the bottom. Sure enough, the head lifeguard's down there and he gets his little ruler out. He's like, he's too short. Oh, did he look? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I convinced him too. I told him it was okay. Well, it's not okay. And he kind of let me have it. Why? Because there was an aid, there was a height requirement for that slide and they were serious about it. I think sometimes in church, we've created a fake age requirement for God to be, to use somebody. We, we've created an age requirement for God to, to, to use somebody to, to make an impact for, for spiritual gifts that God gives someone when they follow Jesus. That there's, we've created this false idea that there's an age requirement to be used by God. In, in Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus, he, he, he tells them this. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and, and the pastors and teachers. That, that's the leaders of the church. That, that, that's people like me, like Rocky. He said, their responsibility is to equip the adults to do his work. It doesn't say that, does it? it? Their responsibility is to equip those mature enough to, those who are older than 18, their responsibility is to equip God's people. Who are God's people? People who've trusted Jesus, who are following Jesus, followers of Jesus, to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. We want to empower the next generation to be a part of what God is doing right now. They don't have to wait. We want to position them to be used by God so they can use their spiritual gift right now, not one day, but right now. We want to empower them and then we want to encourage them. Instead of shaming the next generation, we want to be their biggest champion. We want to be their biggest cheerleader. We're, we're their biggest cheerleader in so many ways. That, you know, when the, their sports and all those kind of things, we want to be their biggest cheerleader when it comes to their faith. We want to celebrate what God can do. We want to believe in them and, 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 and pray for them and expect God to do great things. We are for the next generation because the next generation holds the greatest potential to form the future. And imagine what God could do with the generation who was positioned to experience God's power and God's purpose in their lives. If we were intentional to invest in them and allow God to form the way they see themselves and, and allow God to form the way they see their lives and the world around them. Think about how their story could be different than so many of ours. The story so many of us tell is, is how 
we made a bunch of series of bad decisions, or we ran from God, or we fell away from our faith, and then God rescued us from, from uh, you know, a bo- bunch of broken decisions and broken relationships and addictions and, and problems. And listen, I love that story. That's the story of so many here. We love that story. We celebrate that story here. We love it because it's the story of how great God's grace is, that no one is too far, that God can't rescue you. And if you're here today and you feel like you're too far gone, that you're not sure if God can, I want you to know there is testimony after testimony. There's person after person who can tell you how God has rescued him and and his grace is enough. He can rescue you too. It's just like this piece of Play-Doh. It's dry. it's, It's not moldable. But if I took a little water and I spent enough time with it, it could become moldable again. God is in the business of rescuing and, and restoring what once was broken. And we love that story. We celebrate that story. But what if the next generation got to tell a different story? What if they got to tell a story, not of how God's grace rescued them out of a pit, but God's grace kept them from the pit? See, I've always struggled with this personally because that's my story. I never felt like I had a big enough story. I felt like maybe I needed to make something up. You know, age of six, I was part of a gang and I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know. I struggled with my story because I didn't feel like it was enough. And I wasn't perfect by any means. I just never ran from my faith. I never ran from God. But I can promise you this. There were so many times I saw the evil of my flesh in my decision-making process that, that I hate those decisions. And those were, I have major regrets of decisions along the way. I saw enough evil in my life to know that if God had not rescued my heart and, and captured my heart early, what a mess and a disaster I would have been. See, my story was different. There's a song that I used to sing with my mom. I'm going to ask her to come up real quick. Uh, Sing with my mom. We had a piano in our house um, most of our life growing up. And um, she would, some of my memories gr- growing up was my mom sitting at the piano playing as I, we were going to sleep at night. And um, I'm going to turn this on real quick. Um, there was a, I would listen to her as I went to sleep. Hold on just a second. I need to make sure I'm doing this right. I would listen to, to her as we went to sleep. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, as we went to sleep at night, and uh, I, I may have to do that again because I don't hear it. Uh, as we went to sleep at night, and uh, but there's times I would sit next to her at the piano, and this is the song. Uh, that we'd sing that I feel like it tells our story, my story, so well. I felt sometimes I didn't have a story I could share. I wasn't rescued from a past, destroyed by dark despair. Oh, but Jesus, I have memories of the times that we've been through. And I wouldn't trade one moment of growing up with you. I came to know of you early. I came to love you young. You touched my heart, dear Jesus, when my life had just begun. I gave you my tomorrows and a childish heart of sin. And you saved me from a lifetime of what I might have been. What if that was the story the next generation got to tell? What if instead of saying, I wrecked my life and God had to rescue me. What if instead they said, I experienced God early. And all my life, he's been faithful. And we celebrated what God could do when he captured a generation. Will you be for the next generation with grace? Will you help us be for the next generation by stepping up and saying, "Uh, we're going to serve. 
Not for the short term. We're in it for the long haul because we believe in what God can do through the next generation. If you don't serve, can you, will you just will, go ahead and take your, your, your Play-Doh, hold it up. Will you put it where, where you'll see it every day and begin to pray for the next generation as God is forming them? The enemy would love to attack and, 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 and tell them lies about who they are. We pray for them that God would intervene and they would experience God for themselves. Will you continue to give generously to this church so we can invest in the next generation? Listen, when you took out your Play-Doh earlier, there really wasn't much there. It was just a lump. But the potential was incredible. The next generation is being molded right now. And I truly believe the potential is far beyond what we can even imagine. We are for the next generation because the, it holds the greatest potential to change and form the future. Will you pray with me? God, we lift up the next generation and we believe that you want to do something great. So God, we will speak words of encouragement and blessing towards the next generation and we will believe what you can do. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, thank you, Chris. I'll tell you what, man, I, I love to hear that heart. Love to hear that heart. Um, like he said, take this Play-Doh. Okay? Don't just give it to your kid or don't just throw it away as you leave. But continue to use this as a visual to remind you to pray. To pray for that next generation. Because a lot of times, if you're anything like me, I can catch myself just writing them off. And anytime I feel like I need to write them off, I'm going to think of this Play-Doh. Because they are. They hold the future. And we have a chance to impact them. This church has a chance to impact them. So I'd encourage you to pray for them, encourage to get be a part of that. There's several different options you have to things I can encourage you to do. Take a, scan the QR code. On the QR code, there's several things coming up in the life of our church for students and for children. If you have a student that is sixth grade through 12th grade, I would encourage you to get them signed up for break weekend. We had break weekend scheduled for earlier, unforeseen things, we had to cancel it. It's coming up on April the 16th through the 18th. And it's a jam-packed weekend, has a, a speaker coming in just for students. The band's coming in for students. It's gonna be a lot of fun. There's gonna be food. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a great weekend. I would encourage you, if you have a student or know someone that has a student in that, in that age group, get them signed up for that weekend, okay? Get them signed up, get them plugged in for that weekend. I can promise you this, money back guarantee they're gonna have a great time. If they don't like it, I'll give you your money back. No, Chris will give you the money back, okay? Um, but it's going to be a great weekend. Also, there's other things on that link tree, on that QR code, if you scan it, that has stuff about student ministry going on this summer for mission trips, camps. There's also, also things for our children's ministry on there. I want you to scan those things and find out what's going on so you can get your kids plugged in. Because just like Chris said, we're in this together. As parents, you're not by yourself. As grandparents, you're not by yourself. We want to come alongside you and help you as we continue to mold that next generation. Because, guys, the future's there. Are we going to write them off or are we going to embrace it and help them be what God has called them to be? Man, what a great challenge. Thank you, Chris, so much. We're going to continue this series next week. We wrap it up with We Are, and uh, Chris will be wrapping that up next week. It's going to be a great one. So thank you so much for being here. Remain seated, okay? Um, our ushers are going to dismiss you according to who they like the most, so just chill. I'm just kidding. They're going to dismiss you according to sections, okay? But anyway, y'all have a great week. We'll see you back next week.